Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, so I've just been introduced and Sue Ellen had asked me to introduce Eric Kleinenberg because as a member of the library community, I see firsthand what Eric's most recent book, Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life is all about. We're very fortunate here on the Vineyard to be living in a place that really treasures its public libraries, all six of them. Each one is unique, each one reflects the values and the interests of their respective communities, and each one serves as a community center providing the opportunity for lifelong intergenerational learning, cultural enrichment, and social exchange. What you may not know is that our, our libraries also provide food, shelter, and a safe place for all of us. The weekend before last, when the temperatures were in the high 90s, the West Hisbury Library served as a cooling station. So we had a place for people to be in uh, air conditioning with cold water, books, computers, and of course, internet access. Our libraries uh, host these free lunches during summer and school breaks. We provide warmth in the winter for those who are cold, can't afford heating, or have housing challenges, and train staff to deal with many of the issues that, w that face all of us. And most importantly, what our libraries provide is a place for us to meet others, reduce social isolation, and build community. And Eric's book, which I've actually read a couple of times uh, before I knew that I'd be introducing today, is very timely in pointing out that as polarized as we are as a nation, American voters are undivided in their support of public works projects to rebuild our nation's transportation, food, water, and communication systems. And his book argues that rebuilding our social infrastructure is just as critical. Eric Kleinenberg is a professor of sociology and the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU. He co-authored the number one New York Times bestseller, Modern Romance, and is the author of the acclaimed books, Going Solo and Heat Wave. In each one of these books, what Eric does is he examines an important phenomenon under the lens of a social scientist, and then he crafts books that are factual, interesting, and immensely accessible. His latest book is no different. Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life is a fascinating read. And it was also named as one of NPR's best books of the year. Please join me in welcoming Eric Kleinenberg. Thank you so much. That was such a nice introduction. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you actually being in this tent and not the other ones. Uh, each of you has like the value of four or five people to me. And it's, it's really important you're here because I brought my son for the first time on my book tour to come see it. And I was, got really nervous that uh, he's going to leave now because he made me promise I wouldn't talk about him when I got up here. But the last thing you want is for your son to see you give a book talk to an empty tent. So, so we're going to like, we're, what we're going to do in this room for the, or this tent for the next 45 minutes is have so much more fun than everybody else at this book festival. And people are going to start wandering over from all the Pulitzer Prize winners be like, what's going on in that tent? I want to get in on that. And the way that I want to get us going here is it's a Sunday, which is a good day for telling stories to each other. And I, I want to kind of invite you to, to understand what I try to do in this book by telling you a story about my own life. And this is a story from a, a, a several months ago. It was that, you know, that period between Thanksgiving and Christmas where, uh, you know, the world's starting to change and you kind of are preparing for all the family coming and there are big things happening. And this was a really big period for me also because it, my, this, this book that I'll be talking about today came out last fall. It's called Palaces for the People. And the concept is... Um, can you hear me if I yell? Is that better? Uh, if the mic, there's, the mic is back. Okay. So, um, so, so this is a book, it's it, Palaces for the People. This title comes from... Andrew Carnegie, it's, a, it's his view of what the library is, right? This kind of special institution that lifts people up and is very generous with them. And I was on um, book tour for a lot of the fall. I was, I was traveling a bunch. And, um, you know, it turns out that when you're on book tour and you're an author, um, if, you, if you're married, if you have a family, you know, this might be news to some of the men in the, in the tent here, 
but this takes a toll on everybody when you're gone for a long time. And there's all this work that has to happen for the house to work well, right? And when you go away for a long period of time, that typically falls on your spouse, right? And so I've been gone for, you know, I've been traveling a bunch. And my wife, uh, who's also a professor, also a writer, and does 25 other things, uh, was suddenly in charge with all this stuff at the house. So she was like, me being gone really was putting a toll on, on her. And um, so I was really, I owed her something, you know, and I, and I owed her a lot. And so I don't know if this ever happens to those of you who have spouses or live with someone, but this is one weekend day, uh, and I came back home, and uh, I was with the family. I woke up really early in the morning, and it was like 7 o'clock or 7.30, and my wife kind of turned to me, and she said, um, hey, honey, uh, I'm going to go out and hang out with friends today. I'll be back around 5 o'clock. Bye. <laughs> and she closed the door, uh, and she was gone. Like, she was just... She was gone, uh, and she was not coming back for many, many hours. And like I said, this was completely acceptable. Like, she had more than earned it. I, I, was, I was deep in the hole. But it, it created this kind of predicament for me, which is that there's so many hours between 7 in the morning and 5 p.m., <laughs> and I had to figure out, you know, what I was going to do. So this is the only time I'm going to talk about my son uh, in this conversation today. But... So I, I, have, I had two kids. I have a son who's, who was 12 at the time. He's now 13. And a daughter who was 9 at the time, now 10. And um, the thing you need to know about raising boys now when they're 12 or 13 is that there's actually nothing you need to do anymore. This is not a big issue. Because there's a whole new technology for parenting called Fortnite. I don't know if you know about Fortnite. But it is, if you don't know about Fortnite, you know, rest assured, you never need to deal with your child again. Fortnite, your, your child wants to do Fortnite more than anything else, and so I could just like let my son, I don't let him play Fortnite very much, but this day was like fine to have him play some Fortnite. Because it's a lot of hours, right? But my daughter, you know, at the time was nine years old, and so this is this life stage, for those who have, you know, haven't had children in a while or haven't had them yet, it's like, it's a lovely life stage because they're kind of like smart enough and engaged enough and know enough about the world to talk to you and have great conversations, but they also uh, still want to hold your hand and walk down the street with you, right? So it's this kind of sweet time, and I had to spend, a, I had to do a bunch of stuff with my daughter, and she's pretty picky about what she wants to do. So as it happens, uh, I had just read this article in the New York Times that came out, you know, a few weeks before about uh, the new concept in retail in the United States called the Amazon Four Star Store. Do you guys know about the Four Star Store? So this is, this, if you don't have a four-star store, you need, you need to know about it. It's this new idea, and basically Amazon wants to get in in the retail game, and they have these stores, and everything in the store has been rated four stars or more by Amazon consumers, right? So you know that everything there is going to be amazing. Um, and it was weird to have a New York Times story about it, but it was, a, it was kind of a sensation when it opened up. You know, people were flocking to the store, and there was a buzz and a scene, so they did the story, and I thought, you know... This would be a thing that my daughter would be willing to do, uh, and so I could. T I want to take her down there, and I asked my daughter, you know, would you be up for going to the four-star store? It's in Soho. It's not too far away, and she was totally up for it. Uh, but that wasn't going to be the end of the of the of the day. That we needed to do more. And as it happens, like one of the great things about being a social scientist, you know, which I am, not just a writer, uh, and having children, is that on the weekend you can do all these experiments with them, you know, on them really. Uh, and you don't need to get permission from anybody. Nobody's monitoring you. You can just kind of do what you want to do. And so I thought, like, why don't I throw in another component to this experience? And after we go to the Amazon four-star store, we are going to go to my favorite branch library in New York, which is a, a branch library uh, in Seward, called Seward Park. And, um, and, and you know, so I, I threw this in. And I, have to, I will admit to you what I did not tell her at the time as my friends from New York walk in, uh, surprisingly, uh, which is that um, uh, I, I wanted to skew this, this experiment, and I doctored, I doctored a little bit because I didn't just want her to compare and contrast the, the Amazon four-star store and the branch library. I also kind of wanted her to think that the, the library was more awesome. And so the plan I came up with is that when we went to the four-star store, I was not going to buy her anything. I was going to say no to everything she asked me for. And then, um, and then when we went to the library, she could ask me for anything, and the answer was going to be, right? So I, I, ha I was in total control of the situation. And we walked down to the four-star store, 
And I have to tell you, it really is an awesome experience to be down there. So um, they have lots of things. They have like um, a lot of electronic gadgets and party things. Um, they had that, uh, the floating vacuum cleaner that works without you. I think it's called the Roomba. Is it Roomba? Sometimes I say Zumba and everybody laughs at me, but I'm pretty clear now it's the Roomba. Do you know what I'm talking about? And she was very into that. And they had a, um, a talking Chewbacca doll, which, which she spent about half an hour with. And um, normally I wouldn't like that, but you have to remember, five o'clock is when my wife is coming home now. So it's fine to have the Chewbacca doll. She was with it. And, and we walked around the store, and at the end of our time there, I realized that she had asked me for about $1,200 worth of stuff. You know? And I said no uh, to everything. And I thought that that would make her you know, frustrated. I pro I'm going to admit here, I probably underestimated uh, how upset she was going to be about that situation. But she was upset. And on the one hand, that was a problem. But on the other hand, one of the things that I wanted to convey in this lesson is that when you have a society that organizes public life and leisure time and free time around consumption, around going to the mall or going shopping, uh, that will often wind up being a somewhat empty and unsatisfying experience. You know, I don't know if how many of you do this, but I find like even when I go out and spend a Saturday shopping and I get the thing that I wanted, the pleasure, the meaning I get from that object doesn't last all that long. And a lot of the times what happens when I go out is I start seeing all these other things that I really wish I could have, but I can't get them, and I wind up going home really frustrated. That's happening to me as I drive around and look at the houses for sale in Martha's Vineyard this weekend. Um, but you know, we all have our, you know, we all have our struggles in life. So, so, so I wanted her to have that. Now she was maybe slightly more upset than I had expected, but it was, you know, it was fine. Basically, we pacified the situation. Um, you know, she, we came out of it, and she was ready to go on to the library. And so, so we started walking from Soho to Seward Park, which is in the Lower East Side of New York City. Does anyone here know the Lower East Side? Or? of New York, okay, not everybody, but the Lower East Side is like the classic American immigrant neighborhood. I mean, now maybe Jackson Heights, but it's the, it's the iconic American uh, immigrant neighborhood, you know, uh, uh, lots of tenement apartments and uh, was once very Jewish and Russian, now very Asian and Latino. So it's kind of like when you walk in the Lower East Side, um, you really feel that part of the American experiment, you know, that's so, uh, uh, important, which is the, pl the, the city as a place of incorporation. But also, um, this came up yesterday in our conversation a bit, the Lower East Side is a place where there's a lot of gentrification. Is that a thing that, that you think about gentrification? So like, if you're the kind of person who wakes up on a Saturday morning and you think to yourself, you know, where today could I find a $12 ice cream cone, uh, you know, at a place where the only flavor is salt? Uh, you know, if, if, if that's what you're like, like the Lower East Side is where you want to go. And as you're walking into the Lower East Side, you really feel the tension between these two worlds, like the world of the, the coffee shop that doesn't take cash and the world of immigration, right? They're, they're together. And so, you know, my daughter and I are walking and I start to tell, we talk about gentrification and how that's changing the neighborhood. And you think that's a weird thing to do? I always, whenever I describe this story, someone gives me this kind of judgy look, like, you know, you're crazy to do that. But I just, no, I, it's, it's fine. I just wanted, I, I want to let you know, like, my wife and I are college professors. We do not have a million dollars to get our kid into college through the side door. So we really have to do, like, we have to teach them things, you know? That's the only way they can, they, they're going to be able to pull this off. So, so we're talking about this with this stuff. So, so, you know, we're going, we're having this great experience, and, and we're heading towards the Seward Park Library. And this is an amazing library. This is a Carnegie Library, uh, the kind of classic vintage. It's got that, the beautiful steps that lead you up into uh, the entry room that has very large ceilings and these enormous windows. And the, the very design of the place is a, a signal to everyone who's who enters there that this is an institution that wants you and trusts you and that's here for you and will be generous with you, will we'll expect the best of you and will and we'll give you a chance to be the best of yourself. It's, a, it's an amazing place. And I could see it off in the distance, and we got about 100 yards from the front door, and I realized that this brilliant plan I had come up with was about to fall apart. And the reason is that outside of the library, there was an enormous metal gate, and on this gate, there were two locked padlocks, and the thing was closed. And I had to scramble, right, because this was not part of the plan at all here. And I turned to my daughter and I said, you know, why do you think the, 
the library's closed. And she said to me, Dad, everybody knows the library's closed. It's Sunday, you know? <laughs> and, and you know, like, I had just written this book where I spent uh, every day for a year going to branch libraries. So the researcher part of my brain knew that the library was closed on Sundays, but the father whose wife was away until 5 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> was desperate for that library to be open, right? I needed that library there. And um, so I said, you know, well, uh, you know, why do you think, uh, you know, why do you think it's closed on Sunday? And she said, well, it's Dad, because Sunday is a religious day. You know, people go to church. And I was thinking, well, you know, it's, it is the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, that's not really a thing here. Um, but that, but, but the real thing I was thinking about is, is, um, you know, actually like, Sundays used to be the busiest, most popular day for the library in all of New York City until not too long ago because Sunday is the day when you wake up and you're looking for something to do with your family and you want to be with your, your neighbors and you, know, you don't want to just shop. You want to go and be together you know, in a place that's, that, that's got a place for you to sit down and a book for you to read and things for your kids to do and programs and, and community, something like that, right? So Sunday was very popular. Why is it that... Um, the library was closed on Sunday. It's not because there's a line in the Old Testament that says, you know, and on the seventh day thou shalt close the libraries. You know, that line does not exist. It's because we have so dramatically slashed the budget for libraries and things like it that we think of those kinds of programs as luxuries. And in fact, there's lots of places in New York where you're lucky to be able to get into a library on a Saturday. And you used to be able to get into a library until late at night, and now you can't get in after eight. You know, and in some places, six. Because I, and, and we're lucky in New York City compared to places that are slashing the budgets for libraries and closing them down altogether. In England, they're selling them off for real estate. So it occurred to me as I was talking to my daughter about this experience and processing it that libraries really matter because, you know, not because they're places for books, although they are, and not because they're places where we uh, learn things, although we do, they matter because they, they have become uh, one part of what I've come to think of in my work as, as our vital social infrastructure. And that's a really wonky concept, social infrastructure. It's not one that you probably were talking about at breakfast this morning. But it's, a, it's, a, it's the big idea in my book, and I want to explain it to you. But by social infrastructure, what I'm trying to say is that in the same way that there's an infrastructure that makes the circulation of water or power or transit possible, so too is there a set of physical places and organizations that shape our capacity to engage in social life. And when we invest in social infrastructure, when we take care of it, when we design it well, when we maintain it, we generate all of these you know, positive benefits um, that, that, are, that can actually be quite profound. And at the same time, when we fail to invest in social infrastructure, if we, if we don't design it well, if we don't build it, if we let it fall apart, we become all the more likely to kind of hunker down and stay at home and complain about the crisis in community, which we think is a cultural thing, right? So to give you just one kind of example of another kind of social infrastructure, not just the library, but think about the playground, as, which is a fairly new invention, you know, the idea of a playground. It's a pretty new thing. In fact, Seward Park in New York sits in the first municipal playground uh, in American history. If, if, if you've had children again, this will be the last time I talk about children in this conversation, and then you can leave, uh, and you know, it'll be fine. But try, estimate, just tr try to come up with a number in your mind about how many relationships have started in the last 100 years of American life because two families happen to go to the same playground that's in their neighborhood around the same afternoon. Like you've got two mothers or fathers or grandparents or caretakers who push the same set of swings around the same time and day often enough that at some point somebody has to get off their phone and confront the other person, right? And, and you st strike up a conversation and you see that person often enough and at some point you get a call and they say, you've got to come and do this or take this work thing that's going to take 20 minutes. And you say to this person who is kind of a stranger, would you mind watching my daughter for a few minutes on the swing? And you can do that because you share this place together. And bef next thing there's a play date you know, and then the families get together. And, st you know, it's my view that community happens, the thing that we're all chasing in life, this connection. It happens because there are these small incremental things that start in a playground, right? They start in some gathering place. So think about the relationships that happen that way. And then think about the consequences of living in a neighborhood that has no playground where you can go at all. 
and how much less like you are to build something, something like that. That's, that's social infrastructure. And it turns out that this is a concept that's been in my mind for a long time. The first book I wrote was a book about a heat wave in Chicago uh, in the 1990s where, where more than 700 people died in a heat wave that lasted just a couple of days. It was a true uh, catastrophe that very few people remember or talk about, but actually has real significance. And I was just starting graduate school at the time that the heat wave happened, and I, I grew up in Chicago, and so I was curious about it, and I started looking at the event, and, and one of the things I did, actually all sociologists kind of have to do this before they start doing anything, I, I, created, I made a map, and I just wanted to look to see kind of who, where the action was, you know, who died and where were they. And it turned out when I looked at the map the first time, it was the most predictable map in the history of social science. It was like the neighborhoods that suffered the most in Chicago were the segregated, impoverished, vulnerable African-American neighborhoods on the south side and the west side, and everybody knew those places were vulnerable. Scientifically, it was the least interesting thing in the world to find that those places you know, were vulnerable. It, politically, it raised some big questions. You know, since we knew that, why didn't we do more to protect those places and people? But scientifically, it didn't look that interesting. But then I kind of turned the microscope lens a little bit more and, and zoomed in, and I noticed this pattern that no one had really seen before, and it's really changed my life, see, see, having seen this pattern. What I, what I observed is that while it was true that the map of the heat deaths kind of we're in sync with the map of inequality in Chicago, there's something much more interesting happening, and that was that there was a bunch of neighborhoods in Chicago that looked demographically on paper like they should have fared catastrophically badly, and did. But there were also a bunch of neighborhoods, and this is what no one had seen, that demographically were pretty much identical to the neighborhoods that fared very badly. In some cases, they were separated by one street from a neighborhood that did very badly, but instead of having lots of deaths, these places turned out to be the safest places you could be in the entire city of Chicago. Safer than the Lincoln Park in Old Town, which is where I grew up, safer than the Gold Coast. These were literally what we call now the most resilient places in Chicago. And they were 99% African American and very poor, and nobody saw that coming. And the question was why? You know, what made one place so vulnerable and another place so capable of surviving given that they had the same people and were separated by a street. So I started to look really closely and the thing I observed, and I'm gonna just kind of use you all as props since you were so generous enough to come to this tent. Uh, imagine like you've got this neighborhood here, we're gonna call uh, this neighborhood Englewood. And what's happened in Englewood in the decades leading up to the heat wave in the 90s is that a place that once had 120,000 people living in it has been shelled, it looks bombed out. The big in industrial employers left, the banks and the grocery stores, uh, the commercial sector left, people started to leave, families got broken up, and what was left behind uh, is a community of about 50,000 people, and there's lots of abandoned properties, you know, abandoned houses, empty lots, the lots have debris and tra you know, trash, weeds, they're, they're blights, uh, the sidewalks are broken down. There's not enough kind of political power collectively here to get the city to come and do things, so the place gets neglected. And what happens if you live in Englewood is you learn to survive by taking care of yourself and the people in your family you know, who, live, who live with you. But a lot of people are away. And the whole project of hanging out in the neighborhood to be part of sidewalk culture, walking around building friendships, that doesn't happen here as much because the conditions in the, in the public areas of Englewood are really falling apart. They're, they're pretty dangerous. And so people are hunkering down as a survival strategy, and a lot of people are living alone. And what happens in Englewood is that the heat wave comes, the power goes out, a lot of people don't even have air conditioning, it's very poor, and people stay at home. And you don't notice that your neighbors aren't walking around, you don't have, because there's not a lot of people who you see every day and say hi to every day who you know to look out for. So what happens is Englewood here turns out to be one of the most deadly places you could be in in Chicago. Massive de death rates. Literally right across the street on this side of the room, right over here, is a neighborhood called Auburn Gresham. Demographically almost identical to Englewood in, in 1995. But Auburn Gresham has stayed intact. The, the population level the same as it was 40 years before. There's no empty lots. There's no abandoned buildings to speak of. It's got a far more vibrant commercial sector than you would imagine. There's, there's sidewalk life. There's nonprofits, neighborhood organizations. And if you live in Auburn Gresham, which is separate, again, one street away, 
you wind up organizing your daily life in a very different way. And here, you know, if Suketu doesn't come out, you know, Beth, Beth is used to seeing Suketu on a stoop and walking down the street, and she notices that Suketu wasn't there that day, and so she knocks on his door and scale that up. And what happens is, in Auburn Gresham, the, the, the social infrastructure of the place means that it operates in a way that's completely different than Englewood. That's not a cultural thing, that's not a racial thing, that's not an economic thing. That's about the characteristics of the place. Nobody dies in Auburn Gresham. It's a completely different experience. But this is the crazy thing that really shaped my thinking about this issue and why it matters so much. It's not just about the heat wave. The life expectancy on this side of the street during ordinary times, the life expectancy in Auburn Gresham is five years higher than it is in Englewood. Five years, right? That's a, that's a tremendous difference. And that's what social infrastructure is about. So years later, after the heat wave, I, I was living in New York City and it was the fall of 2012. I had uh, just been appointed the director of this thing at NYU called the Institute for Public Knowledge, which is a place that does a lot of kind of uh, publicly engaged research we have big working groups, we do a lot of events, and when I became the director of this institute, I announced that the big focus of our work was going to be uh, climate change and the, and the city. And one month after I took over that job, Sandy happened. How many of you guys remember Sandy? Or feel like, how many of you feel like you were touched by Sandy in some way, like you came? Okay, so, so Sandy hit, and Sandy really touched us in Manhattan, it touched us in lower Manhattan. We didn't have power for five days, NYU was out of power, and when, when, when the power came back on, I sent an email to everybody, and I said, we're gonna meet at the Institute today. If you're interested in doing anything that will help us figure out what's going on with this city right now, please show up, and lots of people did, lots of faculty and graduate students and staff, and we, we started doing all these projects to, to make sense of, of climate change uh, and Sandy and the future of New York. And I started writing articles. I wrote a long piece in The New Yorker about adaptation and about social infrastructure and um, why the city had fallen apart in the way that it did. And one day I was sitting in my office and I got this phone call uh, from the Obama administration. You guys remember the Obama administration? Does anyone here remember them? Yes. Feels like so long ago, doesn't it? The Obama. I like to think of that as the age of reason. Um, uh, and, and, and they said, listen, you know, we've been, we've been following the work you've been doing on, on Sandy and your work on social infrastructure, and we, we want to get, get thinking about it and do working on it more seriously, and, and, and we have just sponsored this program from Congressional Relief Funds for Sandy. There's about $50 billion that went to states and cities affected by Sandy, and we just started this program called Rebuild by Design, and the idea was that uh, we want to have an international design competition to get the world's best architects and landscape architects uh, and, and, and engineers thinking about what it means to build 21st century infrastructure. And um, that was a really exciting opportunity to do that, and it was kind of a surprising thing to get in, but it, it was really important to, to incorporate these ideas about social infrastructure into the post-Sandy uh, planning, because I don't know how many of you remember this, but right after Sandy hit New York, and, and people in that city, and I think in Boston and Washington, a lot of places around uh, the northeast of the United States realized just how vulnerable we were. S th there was a, a very strong response from leading engineers and policy officials in New York uh, about what New York City needed to do. And, and, and I swear you could find this now if you go look at the old, co old copies of the New York Times, but the, the big policy idea right after Sandy, what does New York City need to do? Tell me if this phrase sounds familiar. This is what, this is what people were arguing. New York City needs to build a... That was so lackluster, build a wall. Like I, I, I promise you I could give this speech in other cities and I would get a much more robust response. You know, Martha's Vineyard, you gotta step it up here, but... This sea wall, that's a very polite way to put it, right? So build a wall, and that, that really is the case. Like there, there are these designs that were all over the, the city. It was like giant walls around Manhattan. And you know, that turns out to be a pretty bad idea for a bunch of reasons. I mean, so, so I, should, I don't wanna be glib about this. I mean, there are a bunch of cities that would not exist today were it not for the walls that are protecting them from, from the water that's coming. Like New Orleans, if you've been to New Orleans, does not exist without sea walls. Uh, Venice, as you know, London, all of the Netherlands, like seawalls are important things to have in places, but, but seawalls actually also can introduce a bunch of problems. Like if you ever build a giant seawall, you then have to live behind it 
Um, so you look out not at the ocean, but at a giant wall, and that's difficult. And it turns out if you put in a seawall in a place where there's a fragile ecosystem, like imagine a place like Hudson River and all the towns around it and all the life around it, if the seawall's closed a lot, that changes the flow of water and disrupts the ecosystem, right? And then there's this other problem, which, um, which is a bit of a, like a national security thing. And I, I want to tell you that in order to play this role for the federal government, I had to go through a bunch of security clearances. And um, the, thing I, the thing I'm thinking of here, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a secret, but I feel like since it's Martha's Vineyard, you guys seem like very trustworthy people. And I can tell you this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you in on this um, thing. But it turns, so it turns out if you build a giant seawall to protect Manhattan, um, we promise me that you're not going to go sh telling this to everyone because I could get in a little bit of trouble. But is that OK? Is that OK, so if you go to the west, like the far west side of Manhattan, and you look across the river, there is an entire state called New Jersey. <laughs> right? Do you know that? OK, please don't let everybody find out about that. But it's really there. And if you build a giant seawall to protect Manhattan, where do you think the water and sediment goes when it smashes into, you know, to, right? OK, now I know what you're thinking. I, I have some friends who think the same thing. Like, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world, right? But, but right, let me tell you, you look like a lovely person. and. There's some really good things about New Jersey, like it's gotten better, right? Uh, Chris Christie's gone. Um, there's the Sopranos, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Spray, the boss. I mean, you don't want to just throw out New Jersey. So let's say, as good neighbors, we decide to throw New Jersey into the plan, and we extend the wall so it covers New Jersey. I grew up in the Midwest, so I wasn't fully aware of this, but do you guys know that just south of New Jersey, there's a whole other state called Delaware? And when you go south of there, I'm pretty sure it's Maryland, and then you get to Virginia. My geography has gotten much better in the course of doing this, but North gets, the question basically you need to be asking is where do you want to stop building the wall, right? And to be honest, guys, you, we need to ask that question whether what we're talking about is water or people, right? Where do you want to stop building the wall? And the, the thing about the wall is whether it works or not, there's all these other things it does. And, and one of the things a wall does is it, it provides a statement about the kind of people we are and the kind of world we want to live in. And the wall as an infrastructure, basically says we're going to protect the people who are on the lucky side and to hell with everybody else, right? And that's a real issue if we try to get out of this climate situation with, with walls. So um, there was this one day when I was um, working with this amazing team of designers uh, that had done incredible work in New Orleans. And um, they said to me, look, like, Eric, we've been working very hard to come up with a plan that's worthy of rebuild by design. And we think we finally come up with a, an answer. And we want to tell it to you. It's, it's called a resilient center. This will be the last story I tell you. And uh, I said, that sounds amazing. You know, resilient center. Who wouldn't want a resilient center? Can you tell me about it? And they said, yes. Imagine if we had a building that we put into a, a, a vulnerable neighborhood, a place that had real needs. And this would be a, a building. We, we have an idea for a, a town in Connecticut that could really use this resilient center. But we honestly think, Eric, that it could be scaled up. We could put buildings like this all over the country. So imagine a building that was uh, uh, public, that was built very generously. So it, you know, it was very accessible and welcoming. It was meant to be a kind of home away from home for everybody in the neighborhood. You know, It had a lot of different rooms. And the rooms were programmed so they could do different things for different people. Uh, it had uh, you know, pro professionals who staffed it, the, you know, resilience professionals whose job was to be like, aggressively welcoming in the neighborhood you know, to make sure everyone knew that they were wanted there. They said, um, you know, we, we want everybody in the, in the town to feel like they can come to the Resilience Center, but it's really going to be used the most by, by younger people and older people because they're the most tied to the neighborhood. You know, they tend to be here the most. So like, for the young people, you know, we probably have like some special programs in the morning. We maybe we do story time and sing-alongs. We could have crafts courses and things like that. You know, and, and young people don't just walk to the resilience center by themselves. Everyone knows this. They they come with grown-ups, so we'll have like comfortable seating for grown-ups, and maybe we'll have Wi-Fi access and machines they can use. And um, and then for older people, we could do you know book clubs and current events conversations and and you know maybe uh, film every once in a while. Uh, you know, what, what, we think this is such a great idea, Eric, you know, what do you say? 
Um, and I've been, I've been a professor for a long time now, so I know when someone pitches you an idea they're excited about, the first response is always, you know, wow, that's a really interesting idea. You know, thank you, great job. So I did say that, but then I also kind of paused for a beat and said, um, uh, have you ever heard of a library? Um, <laughs> Because what these guys had done, these brilliant, brilliant designers and engineers had done, is they had redesigned the wheel. Right? They, had, they had forgotten about this incredible institution that I think for many of us is part of our daily life and is a, a crucial part of our daily life, vital social infrastructure, but for too many Americans now has become something that we have taken for granted and forgotten and walked past and thought, you know, I don't need that because I have Amazon and I have, uh, you know, I have a four-star store. In fact, you know, maybe some of you saw this. A year ago there was a, an article published by an economist in Forbes. Did you guys know what I'm, did anyone see this article? It was an article in Forbes and this economist said, uh, the library is now obsolete. And I propose that until someone can show me the cost-benefit analysis that cashes out the value of the library, we should knock them all down and replace them with, do you know? Amazon stores. <laughs> Amazon stores. Amazon stores. Okay? And it was, the, it, 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 was, it was a crazy, crazy proposal. But I think this economist was was tapping into something in the zeitgeist right now, which is that if we're gonna get out of our problem, you know, we need a new technology, we need, to, we need the market to work. And, and my book, and th this is the last thing I'll say before we open up for conversation, the argument that I'm making in, in Palaces for the People, the argument of this book, it's not really a book about libraries so much as it is a, an argument for what we used to call the public good, or public goods more, you know, more generally. These things that we collectively decide are worth investment, you know, are worth building, are worth maintaining. They're worth designing well. I mean, think of the New York Public Library. I understand there's a Carnegie Library that's here, you know, on Martha's Vineyard. Um, think about the Boston Public Library. I mean, think about some of the great facilities that we built, the Central Park, you know, the, around the country that have fundamentally shaped our daily lives and created opportunities for us to become the kind of good society that I'm guessing people who are here at this festival feel urgently like we need to do once again. And, and the reason I make this argument is because I fear that in our rush to find you know, something new and to disrupt things, or in our rush to, um, to throw out some things that aren't working so well, we have begun to overlook and neglect some of the most amazing institutions that we've already built. And we failed to invest in them so that they can update and renew themselves and become more and more relevant. Um, the library is a very dynamic institution, and in some places it's really working well. But in too many places, the libraries and the playgrounds and the central parks and the public schools, the public goods and social infrastructure that made this country work well once have fallen apart. And it's my argument that if we're going to get out of this horrible mess that we're in, and it really is horrible and it really is scary, yes, we have to do the right thing in the next election. But that's just going to be a temporary thing unless we get back to the foundations and start building up our democratic culture at the foundations. Thank you very much.